everyone and welcome to episode 22 i believe this is episode 22 no this will be 23 there we go it's episode 23 of words images and worlds and joining me today is author nancy collins nancy thank you so much for jumping on my pleasure yeah uh, i got the chance to meet you last summer at Heroes Con, it was the first comics convention that I had been to. I was wearing a mask, so I was the guy that looked like. Yeah, it. yeah, that that might be why I didn't didn't particularly recognize you. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a good conversation about the Golgotham series mm-hmm. um, because that was new to me, and uh, a couple of other things as well. So I started this podcast just a little bit ago, and thought it would be great to connect with you and talk about reading and literacy. Uh, comics and storytelling and all the things and and your work has been part of my life growing up um so yeah um absolutely so my first question and we can travel anywhere that you want to is uh what what drew you initially to comics and storytelling i'm an english teacher so i'm always interested in those stories of what connects people i just i was steeped in it yeah (sighs) You know, some of my earliest memories of reading like like Walt Disney comics and Little Lulu and uh, all the all the comics in the late 50s, early 60s that were actually aimed at young readers, which they don't have anymore. Um, uh, you know, like Casper and Hot Stuff and um, uh, Herbie, the Fat Fury. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, you know they're, they're um plus and, and that kind of was a uh, and I had older cousins who I got their hand me downs, uh, which is how I discovered uh, the Fantastic Four and Spider Man, uh, which if I'd had those books now uh, I'd be rich. <laughs> Oh, but again, sure. they, they they went through the hands of a lot of kids, so I don't know. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, Superman, the the Kurt Swan Supermans, uh, the uh, Superboy, the old Legion of Superheroes, everything. Like I said, the Silver Age, um, yeah. and the early the early dawn of Marvel, um, and then, like I said, I was just steeped in that, and uh, and I came from, uh, I grew up in rural Arkansas, but I came from a very literate family. In that um, my uh, great grandmother uh, was an educator. Um, uh, she graduated from Vanderbilt and was considered a blue stocking back in her day. And <laughs> and uh, uh, and my mother's attitude was, I don't care what you're reading as long as you're reading. And uh, uh, and my grandfather had been a big. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs fan back when it was in Argus. He had a huge collection of Argosy magazines, which I had those today. <laughs> yeah. But um, but they all burned up in a house fire. But uh, but no, he was a big fan of Tarzan and John Carter of Mars, and uh, and he was a big horror movie fan like Boris Karloff, Bella Lugosi, Long Chaney, Senior and Junior. Uh, so. Uh, grew up with that and um so there was a lot of uh there wasn't any shame to reading comic books or being attracted to pulpy stuff uh especially the you know the weirder stuff and and on my mom's side of the family my dad's side of the family didn't read particularly much but they respected the ability to do so <laughs> so mm-hmm. um uh so that, 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 that my dad my dad was hank hill basically yeah you know, you know, it, you know so whenever i said what was your father like he's like oh, he's ever seen king of the hill well that's my dad <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and um um and i uh, grew up around that and that was also probably the golden age of children's uh, this, uh, literature modern literature in the sense of like uh, Char- I, uh, Charlotte's Web Charlie and the Chocolate Factory what break everything I own cat 
Okay. Yeah, has decided <laughs> so, to. Yeah, well, at least he didn't vomit. That's the last time I did a podcast. He decided to to disgorge everything he'd eaten for a week right on on my feet. You know, the joys yeah. of learning an animal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, like uh, you know. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Worst Witch, um, uh, Dr. Seuss, um, all those were, you know, the, you know, uh, plus, you know, reading stuff like Alice in Wonderland. I, I can't even tell you when I started reading those because it was so early into my childhood that it, that it probably about six, seven, you know, uh, like when I was a brownie, uh, I, I was reading Alice in Wonderland and uh, and all these other all these other ones. Uh, Charlotte's Web, like I said, Charlotte's Web, Stuart Little, um, uh, the World of Doll books, um, uh, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I I also grew up. Um, you mentioned growing up in a rural but literate family I don't know about my extended family but my mother always read to me and it was fairy tales but the thing I remember is like the darker fairy tales you know yeah like well, the darker <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh yeah um but, yeah I taught myself to read because um when I was about four three or four because that my mother my mother there's like 18 months between me and my kid sister. And then, um, then she had my brother when I was about four and rather than, and then she got, you know, she got busy <laughs> and she mm-hmm. had, had a little, little kids deal with and I was, and rather than wait for my grandparents to come over and read to me, I started teaching myself to read <laughs> because I got, yeah, I didn't want, I, I was impatient <laughs> and, and, sure. and, and I started read. I, I, yeah, I was already reading before I was in kindergarten. So that's cool. That is cool. Yeah, yeah. and um, and, draw, and writing stories. Although I couldn't okay. write, I would I would draw them. I would draw stories like in my, you know, like the Curious George books for and Babar. Though those are very influential on me because they're you know the the artwork is very very basic mm-hmm. very colorful and um and i would write stories uh like my, like in my storybooks and then i would stand next to my parents and tell them what the story was nice. <laughs> so it was an early form of comics maybe yeah and, absolutely um and according to my mother the first story that she can remember me writing was about a um, taxi cab that falls in love with the city bus, um, which is a kind of thing because I was living in rural Arkansas. I had never seen either of those things. <laughs> so what what I knew of them was from my my picture books. Yeah, I knew what a taxi cab was and a and a bus was from my picture books. And and but the the bus would the bus wouldn't have anything to do with the taxi cab because he was little. And, uh, and would just fart uh, exhaust in his face <laughs> until the, someone tried to hijack the bus to Cuba, which I, that must have been going on. You know, that was about the time they were started having people hijack planes to Cuba. So I must have seen uh, that on television, on the news. And the bus was being hijacked to Cuba. And the, and the, <laughs> Taxi, and the taxi cab saved the bus. I don't. I can't remember how, but the bu- taxi cab saved the bus, and that's when the bus decided that she liked the ca- taxi cab. <laughs> A story of unrequited love, and yeah, yeah. proving he I had mean... to prove himself. <laughs> <laughs> but he well, and you women. were just taking in the world. <laughs> he liked big women, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you mentioned Bella Lugosi and some of the the horror connects. Is that mm-hmm. uh, part of your journey? Because uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I would was say mon- you're best I was, a, known. I was a monster kid growing up, and that was also the golden age of of monster, you know, of monsters and you know, monster media. 
um because that was when um all the uh horror movie hosts were in sw full swing late mm -hmm. late 50s through the mid mid 60s mid to late 60s and um you know the monsters were on tv the adams family um you know they had Ch chiller theater shock theater um a lot of the, the i mean i and uh, there was also the you know the Hammer movies and the Vincent Price movie, you know uh, Poe movies at the theater. And um, my grandfather was like I said a, a huge Boris Karloff and uh, Bela Lugosi fan. And the owner of our local movie theater was the Malco chain, which I think maybe still exists, um, but. Uh, there was a, he was actually the, as it turned out, the vice president of the Malco chain, but he had picked this small pissant town in, in rural Arkansas to live in. <laughs> um, and, and, but he had copies of like every, he had, he had prints of, er, of virtually every film that had ever gone through that chain. And he kept them in a basement in the movie theater. And uh, when television started making headroads uh, into their business, he he would have like on the weekends, like Thursday through Sunday, they would have the, you know, what was the current film playing. But the rest of the week, to keep the doors open, he was effectively doing like art house stuff. And it was like one night would be all... Westerns or one night would be all, you know, musicals or, or uh, war movies or uh, John Wayne movies, you know, you pick a particular, you know, detective movies and, and it would always be one night, one night, one, one night would be silent films. Um, and, and one night was invariably, you know, like horror movies. And so I got to see a lot of these horror movies on the big screen as opposed to just on television. Oh, yeah. And um, and I would go with my grandfather. Go with my grandfather. Uh, yeah, so that was um, uh, and and one of the first records I can remember him being given was the uh, uh, Boris Karloff reading Mother Goose, <laughs> and his and him doing the Grinch. You know, reading the Grinch, the Grinch that stole Christmas. Oh, and, yeah. and and because of that, I was never ever able to be scared of Boris Karloff. Because I just associated him with my grandfather. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's there's something that's fascinating, the the way monsters work in stories. I'm peeking the Vampirella name above your yeah, head. Um, yeah, well, she's you're getting some glare off of her, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah, I wrote I was the first woman to write Vampirella. Um as a regular writer um, on the series. And that was from 2000 and when was that? Uh, 2000 and, yeah, you know, 2014 through 2016. And well before that, you were also in Swamp Thing, which is yes, what a, I was, a lot I was, of readers. I was the first woman to write Swamp Thing. Uh, and that was uh, 91 to 93. There's yeah. something about learning about people through monsters, you know, uh, and, and female storytellers. I mean, I'm thinking about Mary Shelley here and like um, that vision into humanity. And sometimes the best way to get that is through someone who's ostracized and, you know, the the monster kind of character. Um, it's a really fascinating, fascinating stuff with those. Yeah, well, the the you know, the sympathetic monster is, um, you know, I mean, basically it's the, the template is, you know, the Frankenstein's monster where, mm -hmm. you know, you know, he, yeah, he can't help being what he is, but, and you can understand it, but at the same time, yes, he is kind of fear, <laughs> something to be scared of. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and, you know, dealing with that, those aspects of, of human nature, um, and, um, 
the the werewolf and the Frankenstein monster can often be viewed as you know unwilling monsters or having monstrosity thrust upon them by outside forces, whereas the vampires are usually uh, are better. Even though there's a tendency to romanticize them, they're kind of like the uh, uh, they're the literary equivalent of you know toxic relationships and or, or toxic power structure. Uh, you know, whether it's you know, whether it's the bad boyfriend or it's the you know the patriarchy, you know? <laughs> or it's just the, the hedge money. Yeah, uh, you know, the people the people who you do you know take all you got and don't leave you with anything. Yeah, and 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 if you're not luck and if you're not lucky, you know, they turn you into them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it. A really powerful metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why vampirism is, is I mean, it can be, you know, used as a metaphor for, you know, uh, being the other, in you know, any kind, in any, any kind of sense. Um, but, you know, you can just like the X Men have been used. But at the same time, it's also a good template for, like I said, toxic relationships or uh, power stru structures, um, uh, help, you know, uh, the spread of disease, mm -hmm. you know, or how people deal with how, how or how things, you know, or fighting against monstrosity, you know, just because you are a vampire doesn't mean you have to be a monster. Um even though it'd be easier to be a monster, and uh, that was that was what my 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 first novel, uh -huh. Sunglasses After Dark, is largely about. It's about a female vampire slash vampire slayer, and uh, her fight against um, succumbing to her own monstrosity. Um, even though it'd be easier, it'd be easier for her if she would just let herself be a monster, but she can't, she can't surrender her humanity. Um, uh, mainly because she's not a hundred percent dead. You know, it's the idea that she was, she died on the operating table after being attacked, but was resurrected through modern science. And so she's got a vampire inside her. Mm -hmm. And she's slowly turning into one and has been for the last 50 years. And, uh, and she fights with that thing. And, and I never, I've never made it a hundred percent clear as to whether the vampire inside her, which she calls the other, if that's really a vampire entity, if it's a separate intellect or if it's her, her own id given agency. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and the thing, I, I'm not a big believer in trying to explain things to readers in, on that level. You know, uh, ambiguity is is a true art form. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I like ambiguous endings where it's like, yeah. oh, this is a happy ending. Or is it? <laughs> or, or, or is or that's a, oh, it's a sad ending. Not really. You know, there's hope there. Um, uh, the, to me, those are the best. The best endings are the ones where it, you, it's open to the reader to interpret what goes on from there. And I'm, 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 what I'm saying is, I, I'm, 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 I'm giving my readers credit. Love it, love it. <laughs> yeah, I I teach English uh, during the day. <laughs> And, you know, one of the things I fight against and I kind of struggle with is this idea that I'm teaching works that I love, authors that I love, stories, poetry. And then very often students take a multiple choice test where they're forced to like <laughs> choose an avenue. And I'm going, that's not what it's about. That is not what it's about. Um, but so it goes. Maybe, maybe at some point the education system will give me enough power to say, uh, yeah, let's let's let kids write and explore and create nevertheless well <laughs> yeah they let they let that go into college <laughs> yes <Just like>. <laughs> <laughs> true um so you also i love the way you uh critique patriarchy social structure 
And that's part of what just makes fantasy and science fiction work really well. Um, so this is kind of my lead into talking about the the Gogotham series because I had not heard of it until I met you last summer. And <laughs> yeah, uh, it 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 kind of got uh, swamped in the late uh, in the mid two thousands urban fantasy um, uh, roller derby, um, but you know which is which is ironic since I'm actually credited as one of the handful of people who invented urban fantasy. <laughs> I yeah. just didn't know it at that. I just thought I was writing vampire novels. <laughs> and then, you oh, well, you need to, you know, ex- you know, make hay with that. And by, by that time, uh, everyone was doing urban fantasy novels. So, but, um, I enjoyed work. I enjoyed working on it, and I, I consider it, you know, some of the high point of my my literary output. And it's, I mean, it's a fascinating series, and something about the design too, because I know you worked on a lot of. Uh, yes, you got them there. I was about to talk about the design. Um, they kind of have that feeling of some of the shared universe novels that came out in, I want to say, like the late eighties through the nineties. Um, and, and they definitely have that appeal and uh, lots of interesting things happening in the yeah, stories. It's, it's well, it's um, it, it's well, this is the first, you know, they're still technically in print. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's the first book, Right Hand Magic. Um, and the Gal Gal, you know, it, yeah, it's about the supernatural ghetto of New York City, uh, which, um, unlike a lot of the urban fantasy stories you know where and this is basically where all the supernatural and mythological you know creatures attached to the various ethnic groups that settled in new york uh, live mm-hmm. and they have their own neighborhood just like chinatown or you know harlem or spanish harlem or the dosada um uh they live in golgotham and you know it's leprechauns centaurs uh race of witches um that i created but um uh you know various types of fairy folk and naiads and uh satyrs and what have you and uh they all live in golgotha um which unlike a lot of the other urban fantasy stories that have something like this it's like yeah it's not secret everyone knows they're there Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a, a chamber of commerce called the Gobu, and they have, you know, uh, uh, they sell T-shirts. You know, they have tourism. Um, they um, and they're and and then, it, but as the story goes along, you discover no, it's not just a neighborhood; it's an actual city-state within the city of New York, much like the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that was part of the deal is these these creatures helped the founding fathers break away from from England. <laughs> so they yeah. had a pact with with George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams that yes, this is this is their homeland. You know, you know. They're, so it's kind of like a, they're not a they they're kind of like the creation of Israel, a uh, uh, combination of Israel and and the Vatican, mm-hmm, and like, mm-hmm. an, an exact. You know, and and that there's a truce because basically there has you know the these races uh, and humanity haven't necessarily gotten along much uh, over the th- over the course of the millennia <laughs> they've been together, and and as the story progresses, it it first kind of looks like our universe, but except with magic and then you discover no a lot of things haven't happened in history here that that happened in ours such as there never was um there were never uh crusades the crusades never happened uh the dark ages never happened uh because of that and um uh because instead of the christians and the muslims Fight and and the Jews fighting each other over the Holy Land. They all teamed up to try to eradicate all the supernatural creatures in the world, until apparently God told them to cut it out. 
or maybe not. You know, it, it, that's another thing I left it up is a, supposedly the hand of God came down and wrote, you know, you know, knock it off. You, you know, you do me no honor on all the all their major holy sites, and there's still arguments as to. You know, whether that was actually the hand of God or if it was the witches that 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 pulled a fast one, but no one's willing to 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 find out the hard way <laughs> because God threatened to wipe everybody out if they couldn't get along. And it's not like there's not a history of that in the Bible. <laughs> so <laughs> um so it's a it, it's a you know, it was combining and my my universe is not based on Tolkien. Uh, my fantasy world isn't based on Tolkien. It's more based on Michael Moorcock. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the more Moorcockian um, Lord Dunsany um, uh, into the, the fantasy set spectrum as opposed to, to Tolkien. And uh, so it's more, it's a more weird fantasy mythological feel to it. Yeah, but yeah, there's right hand magic. And it, it also, it's also a love letter to every neighborhood I've been gentrified out of, because the big thing is that these guys are trying to keep from being gentrified out of their neighborhood because it's in prime um, uh, New York real estate is you know, what, what would now be, what was used to be the, the Fulton fish market in between Wall Street and Chinatown, which is now I think called the seaport. I, I used to live in New York. Um, but yeah, th this is this is the second uh, second book, Left Hand Magic, and uh, since the, the, since the, we're doing show and tell, and this is the third and final book, Magic and Loss. There were supposed to be three other books in the series, but uh, it didn't. Yeah, the, the response wasn't that great. Although uh, we were, it, it almost got turned into an NBC weekly series <laughs> a few years ago, but uh, I got beat out by uh, a Charlene Harris vehicle. Uh, um, yeah, but um, but yeah, Gal Gotham, you know, there's dragons or or, there, or at least there used to be dragons. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's more, yeah, it's more about, uh, uh, like I said, it's a tribute to all of my neighborhoods I got gentrified out of, starting with the French Quarter in New Orleans uh, and uh, going on to New York City and the Lower East Side, uh, Atlanta's Little Five Points, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the places where the artistic people end up going. And then after we've improved everything, we get, you know, make it a hot place to, to hang out at the... Uh, money people move in and 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 jack up the rents so i think a lot of people can identify with that nowadays <laughs> oh yeah yeah i live in a basically a tourist town on a teacher salary yeah absolutely and yeah, oh uh, you're in Asheville. oh it's uh so boone North oh Carolina. oh yeah yeah close to blowing rock mm -hmm. uh yeah so and tweetsy railroad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the place yeah, i've been up there yeah, i've been yeah. blowing rock Real estate is crazy, but um, at least the the views are nice. Yeah, um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I, I, uh, it's lovely up there. It's lovely, and uh, but but that's what um, yeah, the Golgotham series was was an interesting um, expansion on that because um, yeah, having to create yeah you know, most of most of the races were were taken from mythology. Um, and um, folklore, except for the Chimera, who are the uh, the, the witch rulers of, of Golgotham, and they're they're kind of a they're kind of like um, Melnibidians from the Elric of um, the the Elric series that Michael Norcock did. They're they they mm -hmm. could they're what you we we would have thought of as fairy folk maybe or elves, except yeah, uh, they're tall you know tall have six fingers. Their hair's like you know, and they also look anim like anime characters because all their hair is different. You know, like purple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <I> like, <laughs> like born purple. that way. <laughs> purple, <laughs> blue. Um, uh, their eyes are you know have cat slits. You know, so they're they they're they're humans, but they're humanoid, but they're not human. 
and they had the ability to handle magic by birth uh, as opposed to having to learn it they have the natural ability to to channel magic because they have six fingers on each hand apparently that makes it easier and um uh, and they used to have dragons mm -hmm. and uh um, and believe it or not i never read george R. R. martin's game of thrones stuff i mean i've known george for like 30 something years but um uh, i'd never read the books and I, I didn't i didn't start watching the series until after i finished doing the golgoth and stuff so i didn't realize i was like you know like echoing a lot of the stuff from game of thrones <laughs> <That's so bad. laughs> but, well that, that one too i mean the social commentary that comes through uh it's nice to share that vision yeah yeah well yeah they they have a lot of, there's a lot of uh 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 problems so you know you know with it's on both sides you know, you show, you know show, it's not just the humans being hateful but the you know the supernatural creatures are also like no, I don't like me any humans here <laughs> go back to where you belong get out of our neighborhood yeah. but, so uh, it, yeah that, that uneasy you know but in the middle of it there's a you know interspecies inter I don't know <laughs> romance between a, a warlock prince and a and a human artist who um, who moves there because the rents are cheap. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, like a lot of us ended up in New York City. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, or or the French Quarter. You know, I can remember when the French before the French Quarter was a uh, hundred percent tourist trap. You know, that was a good forty years ago. You know, back when they still had an elementary school. <laughs> Down there, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and um, and not every other building, every other storefront was a t-shirt shop or a daiquiri shop. So, um, yeah, it's, so it's a yeah. It, 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 I I could just ramble about it, but I'm I'm better if people ask me specific questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I would <laughs> say just, uh... yeah. It, it's worth the visit. It's totally worth the visit. It makes me a little sad that it was going to be a series and didn't get to be a series. So I hope someone well, picks it, it up. It's three books. I mean, back yeah. in the day, back in the day, a trilogy was a, it was the most you could hope for. Now that you have like people with like 23 books in a series, right. <laughs> it was like, um, yeah, at least another three books. I, I've got I've got it blocked out. It's called Chimera Rising, and it's about the reemergence of the Chimeran um, civilization and the return of the dragons. <laughs> One of the books was going to be called Dragons Over Broadway. I oh, love <laughs> so. it. I love it. The cover image is coming to mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and nowadays it just be tight. They don't they don't do covers like they used to. <laughs> true. Very true. Um, so before we have about two minutes left and we can always jump back on and uh, do a bit more recording. But um, before we go, any any other upcoming or recent works? Well, that, funny to uh, mention. I have. Yes. Yes. Blade uh, Runner. This Black is what Lotus. I've been doing recently, which is a uh, uh, comic book series for Titan. Uh, mm. called a ba Blade Runner Black Lotus based on the anime series that was on uh, Adult Swim and Crunchyroll. Mm. And basically it's about a female replicant trying to find out, well, she kind of knows what she, what she is, but she, she wants to know where her, what she can do in this world, which is hostile to her. So, um, and the, the big difference between this and a lot of the other Blade Runner stuff is that it's they made the decision to take it outside of L.A. and take it out into the, you know, the world outside Los Angeles and the Blade Runner franchise. And I have her out in the Inland Empire um, uh, in between. And eventually uh, I'm doing two more. This one's called Leaving L.A. It just came out uh, last month. It's a um, graphic novel. <laughs> collects the four uh, issues I did uh, with uh, Enid Balam, uh, a fascinating Mexican artist. Um, and uh, the next two are, uh, I'm doing two more miniseries with them. I just finished the, the, sec the, the second of these 
three miniseries. Uh, it's called, um, it's set in, in Las Vegas. And this is about set in 2032, I think, which makes it about 20, 25 years before the second film 